Remember uh, from last time we were working with the uh, dipping layer reflection problem. We had also done the uh, horizontal layer reflection problem and showed how we could uh, extract information from the observations. Uh, for the horizontal layer reflection event, we're dealing with a linear relationship between T and X, and that turns out to be hyperbolic uh, in, this, in this particular form here. And we showed that you could uh, determine what the thickness of the layer was and what the velocity of the, the layer was, but we, we had to use the direct arrival here. Here we're assuming that we don't have a direct arrival, uh, or a very clear one at least. And what we want to talk about is a t squared x squared uh, coordinate representation of the uh, time distance relationship. For the case where the layer is horizontal, we end up with uh, a linear relationship between t squared and x squared. And that's really the benefit of the t squared x squared uh, transformation. That's what makes it uh, very useful. So here we, we've got our dependent variable t squared, our independent variable x squared, the slope 1 over v1 squared. Uh, this would be the time intercept squared. Remember 2h over v1 is equal to t0. This is just t0 squared. Now, again, this uh, form lends itself nicely to um, a regression line analysis. And if you look at the data here, this is a nice, clean, crisp, straight line. But real data is often noisy, and it may not be so easy to um, go through this kind of an analysis here, where we just measure off the slope, we, we get our velocity, and um, no problem. But actual data, of course, has some noise in it. And uh, here we're looking at a t-squared, x-squared representation of the data. t-squared, again, is our dependent variable, x-squared, our independent variable. Because the values, uh, the delta x in um, uh, our, uh, our uh, receiver locations is constant, uh, in a t-squared, x-squared representation, x-squared, of course, increases the separation between observations of adjacent uh, receivers. So we'll see that there's a large cluster of data points right here around uh, the smaller values of x, uh, smaller values of x squared. And that gets stretched out here as we go to larger values of x squared. So Now, if we take a look at the data, these are trend line equations. You may be using MATLAB, but precision is important, whatever software you're using. So here I've got about, I think, about 10 digits of precision. And you can see that this is 2.534 times 10 to the minus 7th. This would be our 1 over v1 squared. And I've got 0 0.039796728383. That's our t0 squared. So in a scientific notation, I have 4 digits of precision here, so I get 2.5336 times 10 to the minus 7th meters squared. So I've gained a little precision actually using the scientific notation. So this is, this is the way to go. This would be the way to go to get maximum precision from your best fit, uh, best fit line. In doing that with the horizontal layer case, the best fit slope here yields a velocity of 1,987 meters, very close to the actual velocity of 2,000 meters per second. The T0, however, in this case, uh, you, can, you can see where the T0, we, we have kind of a weighting, preferential weighting of the data points for smaller x. So that tends to give us a value which actually turns out to have a little bit greater error in it than than the values that we obtained when we were uh, doing uh, the analysis in T and X. So we get a, an intercept time of 0.2. The actual was 0.15. This gives us a thickness of close to 200 meters, which is about 50 meters higher than the actual value used in the model. This kind of uh, double check would be, would be useful, but we did very well here with the trend line. 
then it would be kind of hard to maybe eyeball a straight line through the data points or to pick a couple data points you can see where we would be off if we just picked a couple data points. So the trend line approach is the way to go. Uh, when we take a look at the t squared x squared data for the dipping layer reflection, it is very nonlinear as you can as you can see. So our hyperbola here is an offset in the updip direction. Remember, this is the apex over here. This is our t zero. When we plot it in a t squared x squared coordinate uh, frame, we have this pronounced hook in the data. And let's take, well, I'll just point out here that this would be, these would be the up dip measurements. And you can see that they're coming in, coming in earlier. These would be the down dip measurements. And our T0 somewhere in here. T0 squared. So when we take a look at this data and try to understand it, and we go back to the T squared X squared representation of the dipping layer um, relationship between T and X, you can see that we have these uh, cosine and sine delta terms. If we this this would be linear between T and X. If we square this, we get uh, T sub R squared equal 2H cosine delta squared plus X plus 2H sine delta squared over V1 squared. And you can see that we have that now this 2H over V1, remember, is two zero, T0. Zero. And you can see that we're going to have T zeros uh, when we square this, when we square this. So we have a T0 cosine squared delta. We have a 4HX sine delta over V1 squared. But we also have a T0 sine squared delta. And of course, we have the uh, relationship that we'd expect to see between t squared and x squared. And this being a slope? Well, not quite. This combination of cosine squared delta plus sine squared delta is equal to 1, of course. So this simplifies, and we get this relationship down here, x squared over v1 squared plus t0 squared plus 4hx sine of delta. So we have this additional term here and you can see that we've got both the sign here will change depending on the sign of x. So we have both positive and negative values of x. And we could, you know, how do we analyze this data? Well we could take an average uh, of this data and then fit a straight line to it. Um, but we'd have to confine our analysis, our analysis to the range of x, uh, to a range of complementary positive and negative x observations. So if we did so, we'd have a term for the positive measurements of x, we'd have a term for the negative measurements of x, and so in our average we'd end up with, well, doesn't that look familiar? Looks like uh, the relationship that we're that we're familiar with um, from the horizontal layer problem. So what's going on here? Well, we're since we're going to confine ourselves to a range of complementary positive and negative x observations, we're just going to be looking at the data in this window here, out to about here. And we're going to uh, take an average over that shared range. So these two terms, remember, they dropped out because we have a positive one here, we have a negative one here. We ended up with this nice simplification. And if we just take a look at this region of the data here, this is the data that we're going to be analyzing. <clears throat> and for this data, the average is equal to a straight line. We have a linear relationship between the average t sub r squared and x squared. So if we go through uh, this analysis, now th this would not be what you would want to do because you can see that picking the apex is going to be more difficult here than it was in the, with the data in the hyperbolic form. But if you do, you find that you get an apex uh, x value of 1100 and uh, 
40, an x squared apex of 1143.12 meters squared, a t squared apex of 0 0.00576. You could do that. But uh, let's take a look at, the, at this idea here. We know that the relationship is linear between t and x. So, although this doesn't look like a straight line, let's fit a straight line to the data. Now you can see that the uh, correlation coefficient here is pretty low, the r squared value. But that's pretty much what we'd expect. We have these up dip and down dip measurements uh, combined together, so we have a lot of scatter in the data. But that doesn't bother us. We know that the average relationship here is a, is a nice, uh, gives us a nice relationship between the uh, times, the t squared, and the x squared values. So we should be able to get our velocity just by taking the square root of the reciprocal here and our t zero just by uh, taking the square root of this. And when we do that, our t zero here, this uh, 7.14746 times 10 to the minus fourth second squared would be 0 0.0267 seconds. Our uh, velocity, just using this relationship here, we get 3,017 meters per second. And we could solve for h. Uh, just remember that um, t0 was equal to 2h over v1. We just inverted that to get h. And we get an h of 40.28 meters. So. These values are very close uh, to the values that we used to actually calculate the response. We had uh, the values that we used to calculate the, uh, the model data here, h of 40 meters, t0.0267, and a velocity of 3,000 meters per second. So, that, so we're doing a lot better, actually, uh, with the um, intercept time, the velocity, and the thickness than we, than we did um, uh, analyzing the hyperbolic, the data in hyperbolic form. So these, this was the analysis that we conducted on the data in hyperbolic form. We got an h of 37.7 meters, a uh, velocity of 2,821 meters per second, and a dip of 26 degrees. Now, getting the, getting the dip here, we have to actually pick a coordinate pair. So I picked a coordinate pair here, uh, x 100 meters, t 0.051 seconds. And just substitute it into this relationship here and solve for sine of delta we have over here. And when we do that, we get a dip of 26.5 degrees. Now you're looking and you're saying, okay, we did better here. We got uh, more accurate uh, uh, values for the uh, thickness and the velocity were much closer. But the dip using the hyperbolic analysis that we conducted earlier on the last video, we got 26 degrees here, we got 26.5, the actual dip was 25 degrees. So our estimates of H and V1 are much better. Uh, the error in the dip estimate, a little bit higher. But this, in a nutshell, gives you a view of the t squared, x squared analysis approach. We're going to use that um, in subsequent uh, videos. We're going to be taking a look at a couple different uh, source receiver uh, layouts, and we'll discuss this idea of reflection move out, which is the drop in time arrival time as we go out to longer offsets. Ideally, we'd like to be able to remove that and see something that looks a little bit more ge geologic. And so we want to remove this move out. And so that um, also takes advantage of some t squared x squared analysis. So uh, we'll be looking at that in so, again in some, some uh, subsequent videos. So thanks again for joining us, and we'll See you next time.